Welcome. This is a Catapult Education live webinar, and uh, my name is Mark Geisberger. Tonight, we're going to speak a bit about composites, how to create beautiful composite re restorations. I will give you some uh, some tips, some tricks, and um, some of the materials I use to do that. So first of all, a few disclosures. I am, in fact, a member of the Catapult Education Speakers Bureau. In addition to that, tonight's program is being sponsored by Ultradent Products, and I want to thank both Catapult and Ultradent for putting this webinar together and inviting me to present on their behalf. <clears throat> With that said, I need you to recognize that both Catapult and myself work with a lot of industry companies. This entire list is the Catapult group. The ones in blues are companies that I have a, a very close working relationship with. And tonight's program, as I mentioned earlier, is being sponsored by Ultranet. So thank you for joining me, and I hope you find this information informative and useful. So my goal for tonight is really to talk about some of the little things that I've picked up over the years of doing direct resin restorations that have really helped me, I think, create better looking restorations, restorations that I'm proud to say are mine. Um, and, you know, composites aren't easy. Posterior restorations can be difficult uh, and challenging. And I understand that. And oftentimes we're rushed and we don't have techniques that necessarily create lifelike restorations. But my goal tonight is to really share with you some of my thoughts on creating restorations that look uh, like two structure, that behave like two structure, that blend in naturally to the environment. Now, with that said, I want to give you my email. If you have questions that I don't get to tonight or we're too, uh, too close on time, I, I encourage you to feel free to email me at mgeisbergerdds at gmail.com. I'd love you to follow me on Instagram or Facebook. Um, I'm not the most active individual on those platforms, but I do post things and I do uh, look at all those that follow me as well. So uh, please feel free to join me on the social media. In addition to that, I've got a textbook called Aesthetic Dentistry and Clinical Practice, uh, published by Wiley Blackwell. So with that said, I want to give you a brief biography. Uh, this won't be exhaustive by any means, but um, I was educated at University of Pacific School of Dentistry, graduated in 1991, and I'm in my 31st year of practice. When I left the dental school, I immediately returned uh, to faculty and taught uh, full-time until 2018 while still maintaining a private practice. Uh, in 2018, I transitioned away from the dental school and really focused on my lecturing to, to dentists. Uh, practicing dentist, and focused more on my practice. I practiced with my father until his passing in 19, uh, excuse me, in 2018. And I currently practice with my younger brother, Jeff, in Marin County, California. In addition to that, I do a lot of product evaluation with industry, testing new materials or concepts or technologies. And as I mentioned, I'm a speaker with Catapult Education. Uh, my uh, my hobbies and family include three kids and my wife, two dogs. My hobbies are car restoration, woodworking, organic gardening, and painting. So I work a lot with my hands when I'm not in someone's mouth. I'm doing something on a, a car or a wood project or uh, doing a painting. So with that said, I want to talk first a little bit a little bit about some of the products I'll show you that I use with these composite restorations this evening. And I'll start with really a conversation on bonding agents, which has have really evolved. Um, and what you've found uh, in the past is these really isolated bonding agents that were really designed to be used for one or two different techniques. What's happened now is a move towards things that are harder to classify into one category, but if you had to, you could, uh, but they're far more universal in their application. And um, one such example that we'll talk about tonight is uh, a self-etching material, and it's technically probably a sixth-generation material, and I'm a big fan of sixth-generation adhesives, the self-etching adhesives, because of their ability to be used really in different ways. 
When you look at the literature, and I'm not going to exhaust you on this, um, the literature really does support the use of self-etching adhesives. Um, lots of things have been published on the efficacy and the and the use of a self self etching adhesive assessor. You one that may contain chlorhexidine in small amounts as being MMP inhibitors. So the literature's out there. Yet sometimes we're really slow to respond. Now, most of us live in a camp. We're either an etch and rinse rinse individual, or we're a self etch individual. And what I want you to think about is how to potentially live in both worlds using a sixth generation adhesive. Now, with that said, uh, keep in mind that sixth generation adhesives generally combine an etch and a primer into one component and have a separate adhesive. And that separate adhesive is important because that allows us to employ different etching techniques. So I can take a sixth generation adhesive and actually by just separating out the adhesive itself, use it in say a fifth generation mode if I wanted to. And we'll get more into that. So what's really unique about Ultradense product Peak SE and Peak Universal Bond is I like to think of Peak SE as really your etching medium. So in my mind, I think of this as kind of blue gel for dentin. Now, phosphoric acid, we've used successfully on enamel for years. And Ultradent makes a 37% phosphoric acid that we use to do a total etch technique. But the universal, uh, universal bond, peak universal bond, allows us to not only consider total etching, but also self-etching or selective etching. And the way this is uh, a unique system is that the peak universal bond is the adhesive used in any etching technique. So if I wanna etch with phosphoric acid on the enamel or on the dentin and enamel, I could choose to do that. If I'm on dentin and wanna self etch with peak SE, I can do that. And if I'm on a combination situation where I wanna put blue gel on the enamel, phosphoric acid, and then employ peak SE on the dentin and on the enamel, doesn't really matter at that point and do what's called a selective etch technique, I can do that. But at the end of the end, the bonding agent is the same. We still go to peak universal bond. Now, I was privileged in my years at the dental school to have the ability to do uh, bond strength studies with students and faculty. And what we found is that really the sixth generation adhesives, in particular two, uh, peak SE and um, extra from Kerr, were the two highest bond strengths we'd ever achieve under uh, the use of students and faculty doing shear bond strength studies. These are very predictable. They work extremely well. Uh, this particular material can be thinned to a very thin layer. But what's unique about it is it allows me to do a total etch technique using ultra etch and peak universal bond. I can do self etch by just using peak SE the self-etching component, and then using peak universal bond. Or I can take two, both of those, the ultra etch and the peak et SE, and do what's called selective etching using a sixth generation adhesive. So these sixth generation adhesives give us this versatility in bonding. And I'll talk to you how I might consider um, when to use which of these techniques with very good results. Now, the interesting thing about Peak SE is not only is it an alcohol-based carrier, it thins down to um, just several microns, and it contains chlorhexidine, which allows the product to be an MMP inhibitor. Not only does it disinfect uh, 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 an operating field, but it also helps to inhibit MMP activation, which is very, very unique. Um, so that addition of chlorhexidine is quite beneficial. Now, the next thing I wanna introduce you to is a, is a composite called Mosaic from Ultradent. This really falls into the class of kind of a micro hybrid that, that capitalizes on smart, small particle size and very high filler content. These uh, micro hybrids or nanofilled micro hybrids, whatever you'd like to call them, 
I've got a lot of experience with, and these are my go-to. Now, this group of composites, although it represents the most modern composites on the market, do frustrate some clinicians. And the reason they frustrate some clinicians is they tend to be what we call highly filled. And when they're highly filled, they tend to be fairly rigid. But when we get a lot of filler content in a composite, we get increased strength, better wear resistance, easier polishability, and lower potential for fracturing. So everything improves when we get the higher filler content into a composite, regardless of who you're using, but handling. And I found a way around that, and I'll discuss that with you tonight. It's one of my tips for you. It's one of my tricks I do with every composite. Now, Mosaic from Ultradent is around 225 on the aluminum scale, which puts it more opaque than enamel. And that's very important. Enamel is somewhere right around 180 on the aluminum scale. And it's very unique in that it comes in really two types of opacity. One opacity we'd call the enamel shades and the other opacity we'd call the dentin shades. Now with mosaic, the dentin shades have about 2.6% shrinkage. Uh, they're incredibly high compressive strength. They're slightly stronger than the enamel shades. Um, and they're filled at about 68% by volume. The enamel shades to get a little more translucent have a little less filler content. They're also a tiny bit creamier and uh, they allow us to have light pass through our restoration. So on anterior teeth, and I'll show you a couple of cases, we'll employ an enamel shade when we're after some translucency where we want light to pass through that layer and strike either dentin or a dentin composite. So this gives us the versatility of allowing light to pass through. My favorite go-to shades in the enamel would be the enamel neutral, the EN. And I use that really on shades, say, A2, A1, B1, and all the lighter shades. And then my favorite kind of darker enamel color is enamel yellow. And I use that on the A3s, the A35s, the C3s, the D2s, those type of shades that tend to be a little darker in nature. So I found little ways of combining limited shades and making some very pretty restorations. Now you can see the array of shades this product comes in. And obviously um, you're probably not gonna use all of those. Um, Mosaic can come in um, a syringe format or in compules. I prefer the compules because I do warm composite. And I'll go over why that little tip um, is hugely beneficial. So mosaic strength is quite high, as we mentioned, both compressive and flexural strength, which gives it that wear resistance. It gives it that resistance to fracturing. Um, and, uh, and it's a very, very strong composite and beautiful. Now, one of my greatest tricks that I use is composite warming. Why do I do this? Well, first of all, I'm going to show you some of the literature that talks about why it might be a good idea to warm composites. But first of all, um, I like to change the handling. I actually prefer a kind of soft or creamy composite. Now, if I showed you a bunch of cheeses and asked you which cheese, if it were composite, would you like your composite to behave like? And let's assume these are all at room temperature. Would you want a room temperature Philly cream cheese, a room temperature brie, a room temperature Gouda, a room temperature Cheddar, or a room temperature Parmigiano Reggiano? Well, most of you are saying, um, and I don't need to, to know your answers because I can't get them from you, but I know what you're thinking. Give me either a Philly cream cheese or give me a brie at room temperature. That's how I'd like my composite to behave. Well, the reality is most highly filled composites tend to be far stiffer. They behave like a Gouda, a Cheddar, or some, even like a Parmigiano Reggiano, which, which creates handling issues clinically. 
So what I like is all the structural benefits I get from a highly filled composite, the polishability, the wear resistance, the strength, but I don't love the handling. The way around that is a very simple one, and that is to purchase a composite warmer. Now, composite warmers have been used actually um, since the 80s, believe it or not. Um, the first articles really talked about using at the time a relatively underfilled composite, say in a 50% range, and warming it up to be used then as a veneer cement or an onlay cement. And that technique continued for about a decade where there weren't really good resin cements yet that were flowable enough or soft enough to be able to compress a crown into place. So you had to warm things up. And the first art articles published on this really come out of the 80s talking about the influence of temperature on the physical properties of composites. Now, fast forward um, to far more recent data and um, look at Castro's study or Il Karoshi's study that talk about the effects of heating composite on opacity, on the uh, absorption of water, on the sol solubility of composites. And you see a lot. Um, but what's interesting about a heated composite compared to one at room temperature is um, you get greater depth of cure greater monomer conver conversion, greater hardness, and less solubility. And that's been well established in the literature. So simply by heating up your composites, and this time of year, keep in mind your composites are quite cold. They're in cold offices. But by heating them up, you increase their strength at final cure. You increase the amount of conversion. Now, other studies have shown that, um, that heating composites actually lead to less voids because clinicians have an easier time placing them. Nothing is more frustrating to me than placing a composite and then starting to finish it and re realize that you have a void somewhere in the restoration. It's hugely frustrating. Um, and Fro showed that in his study. Now, um, the importance of decreased solubility is, is a big one. We don't want our co composites to immediately starting to break down, and Castro showed that in, in his. Now, Carlos Munoz at the University of Buffalo showed that preheating composites, both hybrid and microhybrids, increased the depth of the surface hardness substantially. So what he found was when he cured with a warm composite and cured with the same curing light on a room temperature composite, and then measured down at 80% hardness from the top, he found that the depth of cure was much greater in the warmed composite. Okay, and that's really important. Now, um, Darash showed in his, um, his study that there is a practical issue with heating composite, and that is one must be efficient. What he was able to show is that after you've warmed up a, co a composite to 155 degrees and you place it, you actually want to cure relatively quickly. And that after about two minutes of removal from the warming source, that that composite would return to room temperature. And all of the previous studies that discussed conversion and all these other things would be moot. So what that tells us is when we're heating composite, we wanna work efficiently, we wanna work quickly, we wanna get the composite in place and cure it while it still has the heat. Otherwise, all the other studies are really a moot point. Now, there's lots of um, warmers on the market. Uh, Voco has a gun designed to fill uh, to to warm composites. So does a, uh, Adent or uh, Addent, um, and it, it's a really unique unique system. We have composite warmers like this. This is uh, similar to one that I use that really can simultaneously warm um, your gun loaded with your initial color and then up to four additional shades. Uh, it's got 
four or three temperature settings for us. And those temperature settings are actually quite um, nice. This is a composite warmer uh, made by BioClear. Um, and they use a lot of warming techniques with the BioClear systems called the heat sink. It heats composite to 155 degrees and can, uh, can accommodate up to two guns as well as additional composite and flowables. Um, the one I use is from Adent or Adent, um, and it heats to three temperatures. First temperature is ideal for anesthetic, and you can see here on the screen an anesthetic warmer to give more comfortable injections. Then it heats to 130 degrees, ideal if you're using flowables, like for a class five or something like that. And when I'm doing conventional composites, I turn it all the way up to 155 degrees to maximize uh, the fluidity of a relatively rigid composite. So these work beautifully well. Um, the setup here on the left is the one I have in practice. If you haven't purchased a composite warmer or used one before, and you're using a nanofilled or micro hybrid, I highly recommend you purchase one and use one. You'll be thrilled at the way your composite handles uh, once you have used one of these. I'm on my 12th year, uh, 12th year of warming composites and um, really can't function without it. Now, I want to talk a little bit about a few restorations and techniques that I use. I'll start with class fives and go over these um, uh, fairly rapidly just because of our limited time. But I want to give you a few little tips and tricks that I use. And I'll talk a little bit about a, how I apply a bonding agent to these. So first of all, when we talk about class fives, we want to bevel the enamel. And I'll use what we'll call an erratic bevel or an irregular bevel or a starburst bevel on the enamel. What that does with your class five restoration is really make the restoration disappear. Now, in a class five on the dentin, you want to avoid beveling. There's no really need to bevel. The reason we bevel enamel is to um, help us with the blend of the color and increase the surface area to be bonded to. But because we're usually in an abrupt joint on the dentin, we really don't need to bevel um, the dentin. And rarely do I consider retention features unless it's an extremely high stress area. Um, where the patient has excessive um, occlusal forces or parafunctional habits. But generally speaking, I avoid that. Now, most of us were taught what I would call a standard bevel. And a standard bevel would be something about a 0.5 to a millimeter uh, across the enamel margin at about 45 degree, and that was a standard bevel. Well, now, a problem with the standard bevels is, yes, it accomplishes increased surface area, and yes, it does help hide some material, but it doesn't hide it completely. What I would recommend as my tip or trick for class fives is that you consider the use of an irregular bevel. Now, that bevel should vary not only in height, but in depth. It should be one of the worst bevels you've ever made, meaning it's very spasmatic, very irregular, um, rather than so uniform. When you do this irregular bevel, your class five restorations will disappear. Okay, so for class five restorations, there are really two techniques that, that I would consider using, either a self-etch or a selective etch. Now, when we do selective etch, what that means is we're going to employ a sixth generation adhesive. And we're going to take that sixth generation adhesive and introduce our etchant designed for use on enamel, phosphoric acid. So the way this works is we would etch the enamel first. Then we take our peak SE and introduce that to the dentin. And if it gets on the enamel, it's not a big deal. It's not going to over etch enamel. It's not strong enough. And then we apply our bonding agent. So it goes something like this. Now, the first thing I'll do is isolate. And I isolate using an isolate. I was taught in dental school to put a 212 clamp and a rubber dam on this. And good luck getting your margins exposed with that technique. So I'll get my isolate in place, which will make the tissue quite dry. And from there, I, um, I will take retraction cord. 
And if you notice, I've placed a very small bit of retraction here just to expose um, that cavo surface on the cervical of this tooth. At this point, if you have, um, um, you've got your handpiece, you're gonna place your irregular bevels. That'll look something like this. At this point, if you have a micro etcher, you might wanna consider micro etching the dentin, um, sandblasting that. It does a lot to increase your retention. And then at this point, you decide if you're going to um, selectively etch or self-etch. If I'm going to selective etch, I'm going to take that phosphoric acid, the ultra etch, and place it only on the enamel. Then I'll go to the peak SE and I'll scrub that adhesive onto the dentin. Scrub with a microbrush, scrub with the infuser tip, however you want to do it, up to you. Um, and scrub, 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 scrub for 20 seconds. And I really stress that you count that 20 seconds because here is where you're going to get the etching of the dentin and a high, high bond strength. At that point, um, and I would etch both of these at once with the, the peak, then we apply our bonding agent on both, light cure that air thin. And then my tip for all class fives is to employ the use of flowable composite. All I need to place a close class five is a mirror and an explorer. Why? I'll place a flowable in the cervical um, and get a little flowable on, on each of the teeth. Then I'll light cure that first layer. Then I'll take an explore tip and uh, place my next amount and just move that around with the explorer tip. So these have been moved around with the explorer tip and I've placed my first layer. I hit this with my Velo curing light. From there, I place my next layer. And hopefully these aren't so big that you need any more than two layers. But we place this and I'll pull those layers into my irregular bevel. Then what I'll do is cure this, pull out my retraction cord, and I'll take a fine finishing burr, a 12 fluted carbide, and just contour these back at relatively slow speed. Now, as I get them to full contour, which you can see or not see, is the bevel has hidden the material perfectly, okay? So <clears throat> it works out extremely well. Then I used to polish these as pictured here with what's called um, Jiffy polishing system from Ultranet. It's a great polishing system. The only drawback is it's three steps. Um, and what I like to do is actually use a two-step called the Jiffy Natural, which I'll show you uh, in a moment. So with these all polished with that three-step, you can see how beautifully they blend in and really disappear into the background. And to me, I love a class five that's invisible. Now I see a lot of class fives and what I generally see is that class five is usually kind of obvious to me right in here. Now this is where we bonded to or obvious right here. And the reason it is, is usually because that individual placed either no bevel or a standard bevel. And the standard bevel doesn't reflect light in the same way as an irregular bevel. So I think that's really important um, trick for you to employ with that. Now I used um, retraction cord from Ultradent. In that case, I used a triple zero, the black cord. Why? Um, because I don't need a lot of retraction. Now, if the pockets are deeper, say you've got four millimeters or it's a perio patient, maybe a five millimeter in proximal, you're going to need a larger cord because you want that cord to retract the tissue ever so slightly. You want that cord to be below the cable surface. But a lot of these patients with recession where the tissue is super thin, don't default to a number three, two, or even a one cord. Look at the smaller cords. You don't want to increase the tissue recession by overpacking. So I like um, Ultra Dense Ultra Pack Cord. It's a knitted cord. It works extremely well um, for this technique. And use the Fisher packing instrument. Now, if you've got bleeding, I recommend using um, Viscostat. This is a, um, a ferric sulfate containing product that will stop any bleeding by using the infuser trip tip and you just scrub away. 
um, to control your bleeding. If I have bleeding from finishing, like I showed you in the last picture, one tip for you is to, before you show it to the patient, just get out your viscostat, give the cervical area a little, uh, little scrub real quickly to get rid of the blood so they don't see blood um, and uh, clean it up to present it to the patient so that they see a nice, clean, pristine area. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about a class four. What I want you to notice here on this patient is there's quite a demarcation of shade difference uh, from the cervical to the incisal. And in fact, this patient is fairly translucent. Even though they have older teeth that have darkened with age, their incisal edge is uh, fairly translucent. Now, this patient had, had a bonding done right here that popped off. And he said, you know, it's popped off several times. And um, is there anything we can do? Do I need a crown? And I looked at the tooth and they said, no, you don't need a crown. You just need something with a little more retention. So when I looked at this tooth, I recognized, first of all, that the incisal edge, especially on this adjacent tooth, is fairly translucent. So I'm going to stay away from my dentin shades with mosaic. I know I need to move to the enamel shades. And I don't stock all the enamel shades, but I look at this tooth and I go, okay, if the cervical is an A35, I'm going to try on the enamel yellow first. So I'll take the smallest amount of the enamel yellow and try that on. Like cure it and confirm the shade. And because I've learned the shading system, generally speaking, when you see these dark orange to yellow teeth, um, that enamel yellow will work out really quite nicely. So what I did here, um, and you can actually see on this photograph, the bevel that was placed, a very standard bevel here and relatively small. So the first thing I do, and this was all done without anesthetic, is I uh, went in and did my starburst or irregular bevel. The same thing I do in a class five, and you can see it reaching into here. Now, the other thing you wanna do is make sure that you break up this little area ever so slightly, make it slightly irregular, uh, and then go ahead and restore it. Now, when you do that, and you just use one shade like this enamel yellow, and you polish it with the Jiffy Naturals, you'll get a result that is, um, is lifelike. Now, as soon as I got this all smoothed off, the patient's like, wow, this is you know amazing. What are we going to do about this? one? I'm like, well, there's minor chips. We could smooth that as well. Um, uh, but the patient saw that too. said, well, this one looks perfect. Now the one next door doesn't look so great. Uh, but I'm not going to sit here and bond these. I would just do a little enamel plasty if we wanted to. All right. I want to introduce you to my son, Justin. He um, is 24 years old. He was born blind, legally blind. He has some sight. Um, but when he was a child, he actually fell in the playground and... Um, had that typical 12-year-old uh, accident where they traumatized their front two teeth. So he did this at a young age, went through ortho, um, and then it came time for us to bond these teeth. And he had kind of put that off because he said, ah, nobody sees them. Um, and he put that off long enough until he noticed that girls might see them. And they said, well, maybe I should fix my front teeth. I can't see them, but someone else will. So, um, I want to show you some little tips I use with uh, I used with Justin. Now, first of all, Justin doesn't have the most translucent teeth, um, and he's got fairly light teeth. So when I'm thinking of my shades, I'm thinking of either enamel neutral um, and a dentin shade on the lingual portion of this, because if you look right here, uh, there's not a lot of light passing through. So I want to mask. I don't want to use enamel shade exclusively. I want to use some dentin shade behind the enamel, okay? And um, Justin's got these, these fractures and we're going to build them down to here. Now I could freehand these and you could do that. Um, but this is my son and I wanted to do the best I'm capable of. And I wanted these to literally disappear. Now, the other thing I noticed on Justin before we did anything is he's got these really pronounced depressions in his teeth. Light reflects off them very naturally. What I see in a lot of composites is people come in here and put on composite, and then it becomes a flat mirror surface. 
and it really doesn't have that natural reflection of light. So one of the tips that I'll give you is to look at the tooth before you even start. Take flash photography, study the picture just a bit. Now, what I did with Justin is um, took this in a different route. I did a wax up of the shapes I wanted for my son. And then from that wax up, I created a putty. Now, this putty was unique in that it wrapped the incisal edge onto the facial by about a millimeter. What that allowed me to do is control the facial volume of material. Then what I do is I make a little incision or cut right through the midline. And that will allow me to put a small piece of mylar into these teeth. Now, when Justin came in for the treatment, I'm going to employ that same irregular bevel. Okay. I want this to disappear. I want you to not be able to see his restoration. Now, here's a typical fracture, far bigger than Justin's. And the first thing I would do is employ this irregular bevel. Okay. That's critical. The second thing I need to do is break up this straight line. See, if you leave that straight line, what happens is your composite will be visible. You won't see it here because you've blended it quite nicely. You'll see this demarcation. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Here it is. Here's the irregular bevel placed. And we want to break up this straight line. That action alone will make your composites blend better. So you don't want that straight fracture present. You want to break that up. It's highly important. Okay, so with that said, if you notice, I've come across here and I've just very lightly modified the surface topography here and modified it here. And it's irregular. It's not so structured. So some are extremely close together. Then I go a little distance. These three are very close together. Then I leave that area smooth. These two are close together and I jump and do another one here. Then we place our irregular bevel across the enamel, okay? Now, keep in mind that when I'm done, I wanna create that anatomy and that contour. Then what I do is I take my putty and I fill my putty with my dentin shade on the lingual and I'll place my lingual dentin. And then I'll overlay that with my composite, my mosaic enamel shade. So these were accomplished with an A2 dentin and an enamel neutral, only two shades. And what I want you to appreciate is, remember I got my bevels all the way up into here, but I'm able to reproduce the same reflection in composite with this beautiful composite. Um, and the way we do that is how we finish this. So I'll use that 12 fluted carbide. And then in this case, I used the new polishing tips from Ultradent called the Jiffy Natural. Now, these are great. There's another product that's similar called ASAP from Clinician Choice, um, but this is the Jiffy Natural. And this is anatomy sparing. So that when I run across these front teeth and I've created all this nice architecture and, and irregularity, I don't polish it away. Now, my biggest beef with say a cup or a wheel is that you'll create anatomy, but the way the wheels are designed is they'll buff away your anatomy. They'll smooth out the surface. I want it shiny, but I want it irregular. So this design of these brushes, these polishing brushes, in a two-step technique, gets that luster, but leaves your anatomy intact. And that's hugely beneficial. Now, I want to talk about class one restorations real briefly and give you some tips here. Class one protocol for me is study your anatomy. Now, this is um, an upper molar, and I want this to disappear. I want this to blend in. How do we do that? Well, first of all, I use an isolate, as I mentioned on, on every patient. And I'm gonna remove the amalgam here. There's leaking under here, there's decay here. When I get this restoration out um, and illuminate it, you can see the decay up under here. So unfortunately, this is all going away. The other thing I always do is remove any little surface stain at the cable surface. 
so that I have a clean area to work from. Now, um, this is it uh, cleaned up with a decay out. I'll come back in here and remove this stain and I'll put a nice little bevel around the enamel. Why do we bevel enamel? It really um, helps hide my restoration, increases surface area, decreases micro leakage around the cable surface. So we'll get the stain out, then I'll etch it. In this case, I did a total etch. Um, and we etch that with the ultra etch, apply our bonding agent, and then I'll put a little flowable uh, resin in here. So I've removed all the stain, I've got this ready to go. And then we think about anatomy. Now, I'm gonna show you um, some tips, but I want you to watch what occurs with the anatomy. First of all, we of course have our lingual groove here, a distal pit. We have an oblique ridge running here. We have a central pit here and a mesial pit here. And in between here are triangular, two triangular ridges. So when I reproduce this, I get my mesial pit, my central pit, my distal pit, lingual groove, buccal groove, oblique ridge with a groove, buccal groove, and this all disappears. Now, here's the trick, knowing anatomy. High spot, high spot, high spot, high spot. There are four high spots on an upper molar or a lower molar, doesn't matter, and three low spots. Low spot distal uh, fossa, central fossa, mesial fossa. So the tip here is remember your 4-3 rule with all molars. Okay, this amalgam actually demonstrates it quite nicely. High spot, this should be triangular ridges, same height as the marginal ridges. Oblique ridge, marginal ridge. Low spot, low spot, low spot. So the amalgam was done fairly well, kind of resembles some tooth anatomy. So when you think about that, if you get this right, and you keep this triangular ridge and oblique ridge here, the same height as this marginal ridge that was intact, and you keep this group of triangular ridges the same height as this marginal ridge, get your central fossa a millimeter and a half below this, generally speaking, in an unworn tooth, anywhere from a millimeter to a millimeter and a half, this one a millimeter lower than the marginal ridge and oblique ridge, you're going to have very little occlusal adjustment to do. So here it is. It doesn't matter if it's an upper lower or molar lower. Four high spots, three low spots. On a bicuspid, the rule is three and two. And for a class one, the tip here is that your marginal ridges are always your reference points. Nothing should ever be higher than either of the marginal ridges. Anatomically, running across the occlusal of either an upper or lower molar. Now, I want to talk a little bit about sectional matrix systems and give you um, some tips to think about. I love the V3 system from Triodent. Um, it's got a new formulation, which I love even better. Uh, the plastic that's used on the um, clamp itself has been re-engineered to be kind of non-stick, so your bonding agents uh, don't stick to it, your, your adhesives don't etch it, um, and it's really, really nice. It stays really pristine. And then we have the, v, uh, the V3 matrix bands. And what I want to point out here on the V3 system is this curvature right here, okay? That's incredibly important for a class two. Now, a class two is interesting. Um, a class two is challenging because you're taking away a marginal ridge and you have to reproduce that. And getting marginal ridge anatomy is something I struggle with for years. The reason I struggle with it, I was taught incorrectly how to do a posterior composite. So this x-ray has been used by Gordon Christensen. It's been used by uh, um, a number of people with my permission, but it is my dentistry. The upper tooth I did right out of dental school using a Toffelmeyer and a sectional matrix band excuse me, not using a sectional matrix band and wooden wedges and you get what you get. The problem here is the contact is way up here and this area is concave. When in fact, your marginal ridge should be rounded or convex and your contact area should be far broader. So using a Toffelmeyer with wooden wedges stuck right here, and then adjusting this with a football creates 
either an open contact or more likely a floss shredding experience. But the sectional matrix band, when placed correctly, create, create the anatomy. Now there's a tip to placing these. I'm gonna show you a clinical case. This is large, large mesial decay um, on an individual. It's huge. When I first saw it, I'm like, wow, please tell me this isn't all decay. Well, unfortunately it was. So I got my isolate in, I started dropping um, into the tooth and the caries was huge. I had to use a liner. I used uh, a liner from, from Doxidental, um, kind of as a direct or indirect pulp cap for this tooth. But what I like to use is what's called an interguard. And an interguard is a product from Ultradent that protects the adjacent teeth. It makes me very quick in prepping. Um, and these are two examples of them being placed on premolars. But these interguards are autoclavable. They're quite thick. And they work beautifully well to protect adjacent teeth when you're dropping box, box forms. So the tip here is get some of these, put them in, and protect the adjacent teeth. You'll actually prep faster because you're not worried about damaging the adjacent tooth. Now, uh, the Triodent system makes um, what's called a wedge guard, and these actually protect the adjacent tooth as well. The only difference here for me is this metal is a little thin, so you can um, go through those by accident. Now, what I wanna show you here is the inner guard in place. Now, here's the benefit of the inner guard. Number one is that this inner guard acts as a separation or a pre-wedge. So it pushes the teeth apart. Not only that, it protects this premolar from me damaging it. But this restoration is really deep carries. And in fact, the pulp is living right here on this young individual. So this one got uh, larger than I wanted, um, but I'm going to go ahead and place my sectional matrix band. Now, one thing that, that you'll notice often with these is they're hard to place. But the trick here is to get these marginal ridges at the same height. So here's the clamp in place, the sectional matrix band, and the wedge in place. And you can see how beautifully this is adapted right here and here. Um, not only that, I favored towards the lingual slightly so that I can actually compare my marginal ridge heights. I want these pretty much the same. Then the trick is to fill right up to the height of this marginal ridge and then down to your mesial fossa, back up over your triangular ridges, and down to your central fossa with the restoration. So the first thing I do, because it's so deep and close to the pulp, I put that indirect pulp cap from, um, from Doxidental down. Then I'll apply my bonding agent and flowable composite. So this is my first layer of flowable. And then I'll come in and I'll put my mosaic composite on top of that. And we'll place the composite and we'll remove things. So here is my groove. Here's my groove, my central fossa, my marginal ridge is curved to here, my mesial fossa, and this restoration blends in. My goal is always to produce something that's hard to detect, hard to see. And this can be really challenging, but knowing the anatomy will really help. Um, and um, accentuating that anatomy is a great way to go. So those are some little tips and tricks with that. Now, the last thing I wanna discuss is just a little bit on curing lights. And remember, warmed composites are gonna cure more completely. Um, but one little um, thing to consider in your practice is, are your curing lights working effectively? Now I use a radiometer and that's because of this study that's well old now, 1999, that I read back in 1999, that talked about how lights in practice may not be working to the clinician's expectations. So Pilo went in, and measured curing lights being used by clinicians in private practice and found um, that only 43% of curing lights at the time, which were halogen, not LEDs like we use now, were working efficiently um, and up to satisfactory rates to cure. And at that time, in 1999, we cured for, believe it or not, 40 seconds per layer. Painful. Um, and then that almost 30% were either would require extended curing time or weren't working at all. So I bought a radiometer and we test our lights 
routinely. And there's lots that can go wrong with, um, with lights. So this is my LED radiometer. It's set up to read LED lights that are generally set at a certain wavelength. Now, one thing that um, one thing that's important is to recognize that when we measure these, um, things may change. So we measure our lights once a month, and we have someone in our office go into each room, take our velos or our demis, whatever light, um, or our velo grand, and measure um, these lights. And keep in mind, there are, there are three photo initiators used in dentistry, camphorquinone, um, PPD, and TPO. And the Velo and now the Velo X are designed with multiple LEDs. Um, and those LEDs cure all three of the photo initiators used in dentistry. Now, the original Velo was um, uh, four LEDs. The new one, the Velo X, has 12, which is really impressive, but these are designed to cure in these different wavelengths to make sure that I cure everything on the market. So if you're in the market for a new light, really look at the, the uh, Velo Grand and um, or uh, the Velo X. Well, with that said, I want to thank you for tonight's program. There are a couple of questions I see have come in. I'll do my best to answer them how to avoid white lines at the margin of composite restorations. Okay, so anonymous attendee. Um, one simple way of avoiding white lines at, um, okay, there's a couple of things that can be going on. Number one, if you're using old carbide burrs, believe it or not, if your burrs aren't cutting, what they're going to actually do is chop the margins. So be careful of that. So make sure, number one, if you're getting white lines, you make sure your burrs are new. Number two is consider using that bevel on, um, on the enamel margin. That slight bevel on any restoration will really help limit white line phenomena. Now, with composites now shrinking so less, it's not as big of, a, of an issue. But the reality is um, we can still get those white lines um, where enamel is literally being cleaved away. Um, so uh, that's um, that's incredibly important. And uh, that bevel will help you. Now, if you want to do a little test of this theory, go ahead and on your next restoration, say you're doing a class one, bevel the buckle margins and don't bevel the lingual margins. Finish your restoration and then inspect both buckle and lingual, and you'll probably see some difference um, there. So uh, my friend Tony did make a comment that self-etching on enamel just simply does not work. And I agree with that, Tony. I really am a proponent of using a total etch um, uh, on enamel and self-etch on dentin. Okay, my question, the next question is not my question, it's someone's question, is why do, we, why do I get severe sensitivity, sensitivity for weeks, months after composite restorations? Okay. Wow, that's a loaded question. We could be here all day discussing that. But let me give you some really quick things to think about. Number one is, um, are you adequately scrubbing and following the protocols of your bonding agents? What I notice with a lot of my students is that they actually under scrub their bonding agents. And when they go to air thin, they don't air thin completely. So the first thing is to look at bonding agents. Have you air thinned completely for the prescribed amount of time. And with uh, peak SE, it's 10 seconds, scrubbing for 20 seconds. Are you doing that? Yes or no? If not, um, that could be question number, that could be problem number one. Problem number two, check your curing lights. Are they curing effectively? Or are your composite restorations potentially under cured? So get a radiometer um, and check your Curing lights. Now I'm going to go up here and look at a few other questions. Um, air thinned means air drying. Yes, uh, Manpreet, that does mean that's what I meant by that. Um, how often is it suggested to check your lights? Okay, uh, Rebecca Cruz, thanks for that question. And my advice is check your lights, not in between patients, um, but check them monthly. 
you're unlikely to have a light go out um, between patients, but you could. But I just check them with a radiometer um, every month um, and make sure you have someone keep a chart and that should be good enough for that. There was a question about what exactly is scrubbing the bonding agent. Well, that's a great question. When you're using a self-etching um, bonding agent, most instructions and really read your instructions from different manufacturers require a scrubbing. So you take your micro brush, you don't just paint it on and let it sit there for 20 seconds. You actually actively scrub the surface of the tooth. Um, and that's incredibly important to help th those self-etching components etch the dentin. And also uh, in doing so, you're helping to infuse that into the tooth. Now, one of uh, the um, questions was about post-operative sensitivity. Most of the time that comes from over drying or desiccating the tooth, improper placement of bonding agent, improper evaporation or under curing. Um, and uh, there was a comment from one practitioner that says I use RMGI base on all composites. Um, no to very little sensitivity. Thank you for that comment. I do not, but more power to you if it works for you. Um, keep doing it. All right, all, well, that's it for tonight. I hope you enjoyed tonight's presentation. Again, feel free to email me. Uh, there's my email at the bottom if you've got additional questions. I want to thank all of you for joining me tonight. I hope it was informative. I wish you all the best in practice. Um, do the best you can. Do beautiful composites and be well.